everybody here is here, Amanda, Liv, everybody knows Amanda, mm -hmm. last week too, um, to present her research on this large porcelain jar or bajillo towel bearer from 18th century New Spain. And it's been my really great pleasure to work with a man for about, it's over a year now, right? Over a year. And this is really an exemplar of a project of what the UMA is finally starting to acknowledge, which is undergrad research in the arts and humanities. And she was contacted by somebody from one of the offices that's participating in this initiative to talk to them about what she's doing. Um, and this project began with what I like to tell my students is a state of disordered enthusiasm, which is the exhilarating period of initial discovery that I think we all are in at the beginning of a research project, which has been transformed into systematic research. And as you will see, Amanda has been an incredibly diligent, systematic, intelligent, and enthusiastic researcher. She's a great writer and a captivating speaker. Um, and this has been an enriching project for everybody, for me, for Amanda, and for the Arizona State Museum. So I'd like to thank, to Diane. oh, there you are. Thank <laughs> Diane. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank Diane and the museum for working so closely. Yeah. Um, this has been great. And this is a really funny story. How is this ending up here? Amanda said in one of our many weekly research meetings, well, what if I, do you think I could maybe like talk next to the jar? And I said, <laughs> next week, lo and behold, she came back and she said, yeah, so there it is. <laughs> um, and I finally would like to congratulate Amanda who will be graduating in a week or so. And she is the recipient of the School of Art and the College of Fine Arts Outstanding Senior. <laughs>
The guiding themes that Dr. Whitfield and I kind of worked together um, to come up with were cultural hybridity, materiality, relevancy, and global and local influence. So I really wanted to go deeper into Talavera's history and existence in the present day. Like, why is this jar still important? Why is Talavera still important? And so I took some of the themes that I worked on in the past, like cultural hybridity and global and local influence. Um, I really focused on those in other semesters. But this semester, I think relevancy was really um, a highlighted one, cultural relevancy and why it's still important. So the current research questions that I am dealing with are, why and how has Talavera remained relevant as a symbol of Mexican culture? How has the scholarship on Mexican Talavera changed how we look at and study ceramics? And what role does Mexican Talavera play in American museums, art, and culture? So looking specifically, we're going to start looking at the Talavera jar that you see in front of you. Um, and this jar usually lives in the Arizona State Museum's Pottery Vault, so it's pretty exciting that it's out and we can see it and I'll look at it in front of our eyes right now. So, I put the full ID for the jar from the Arizona State Museum in there. Um, it came in 1961 as a gift from a collector of Mexican colonial objects. Um, and this semester I got to spend some time with the jar in the Pottery Vault and I really wanted to focus when I was looking at the jar and kind of doing this like physical analysis and material analysis, I really wanted to focus on like what makes this specific jar unique. And so I noticed um, like the loss and the damage of putting the, the jar back together was unique. And also um, something that I really noticed was there's an interesting drooping that happens right here. Like if you can see it looks like the cobalt kind of is slipping. And so that was one of like the interesting finds that I had. Um, is like, why did that happen? Was it something in the firing process? Um, so I kind of was just looking at these like interesting physical qualities of this specific jar. And then here is the object file that came with the jar when it was accessioned. Um, and it came with a little, got a little drawing on the back. I'm not actually sure who did that. It's not signed or anything. Probably a registrar. Um, but so the top of the object file mentions this name at the very top says Maolica of Mexico by Edwin Allen Barber. Um, I thought that was interesting, so we're going to come back to that. But the ASAP jar comes from Puebla. It's an amazing example of Puebla pottery at its height. Um, and this is kind of what the information was of it in 1961. And something that really makes this jar unique is that it's a twin. So its duplicate um, is at the Franz Meyer Museum in Mexico City. and. It's in better condition, um, it's all held together, there are no lost, no missing pieces. So that is definitely um, something that I thought was interesting and I tried to get in contact with the Franz Meyer throughout this semester, but they're a little difficult to get in contact with, so for future I'm gonna keep trying and be like, hey, we have your jar. Um, so yeah, I really, from here I wanted to like broaden my research to find out more about Talavera as a whole because I've seen that what's here at ASM is also the exact things in Mexico City. So I started by doing a kind of Talavera index. So this is a very preliminary Talavera index and I basically just started going through exhibition catalogs, um, online resources, museum publications, and just documented every object that I found that was um, like tin, glazed earthenware, or could be considered Mejolico or Talavera. Um, I got to about 60 objects before I got tired. So <laughs> it's still in progress. Um, and from here, I really was looking like, where is Talavera in the United States? Like what collections is it in? Um, what cities really have done like big exhibitions with Talavera? And so that <clears throat> led me to create a map of Talavera, and in this I have included, um, you can see the Arizona State Museum, um, Mexico City's down there, and Pueblo's right next to it, and I marked the major museums that have really large collections of Talavera. Um, I also marked like major exhibitions, so the Crow, Crow Museum of American Art, um, that one's in Dallas, and they had a major Talavera exhibition that was relating it to Chinese porcelain. Um, I think that was in like the early 2000s. 
and, and then the Museum of International Folk Art is a big example of Talavera. And so, as you can see, um, the collections are concentrated mostly to the southwest and then to the like historic East Coast museums. Um, so it's like the survey museums, like the Matt and stuff, of course, will have collections of Talavera. Um, but the Philadelphia Museum of Art has a large collection of Talavera, which I'll go more into later. Um, and then, of course, there's the State Museum, which is this jacket. So, putting together this map of Talavera, um, I kept seeing a name show up, who I mentioned before, Edwin Atley Barber. And his name showed up in like a bunch of exhibition catalogs, just like about this information. So I thought I should probably look into this guy and his book, Maolica of Mexico. Um, so Edwin Atlee Barber was born in 1951, died in 1916, and he was one of the first American researchers of Mexican Talavera. Um, his book is like the earliest American account of Talavera written in the United States. Um, so he was curator and director of the Pennsylvania Museum and School of Industrial Art from 1901 to 1916. So in the 60s, those two institutions split, kind of, um, and now it's the Philadelphia Museum of Art and then the University of the Arts. Um, and Alan Barber had a specific interest in the Southwest pottery and ceramics. In the 1870s, he did like a westward expedition, um, where he went to like, Arizona, Utah, um, New Mexico, and through there, it was like Southwest pottery, and he was exposed to Mexican pottery. Um, and also under his direction, the museum and school really emphasized decorative arts, pottery, ceramics. Um, and so, his first mention of Mexican Maolica um, is in the 1907 art primer titled Tin Enameled Pottery. So, in Tin Enameled Pottery, um, it's like kind of like an art handbook that he wrote for the school. Um, that's like the history of Stanley Ford's fans, which is a fans who are the same team in the And he notes in the preface that this is like his original findings. He was the first person to write about Mexican Maolica. And he dedicates about five pages um, to it. And the rest of the book um, goes into like Holland and Spain, Italy, other types of Tinanilo pottery. Um, he includes pictures of Talavera from the museum collection that he brought back from Mexico. Um, and he details kind of like the beginnings and his findings. And so what came after that was Maolica of Mexico. So in 1907, like the first half of the year, he published in Enamel Pottery. Then in November of 1907, he visited Puebla and did primary source research and then came out in 1908 with this art handbook titled Maolica of Mexico. Um, so, and in this he emphasizes, like, I'm the first one doing this. And from what I found, he is um, the first one to talk about, the first American researcher to talk about it. So this book is quite amazing. It's 105 pages, all original research. It's, we have a copy of it in special collections, so I spent a lot of time in special collections, um, looking through the book, and it has color plates, so he would give like Talavera images to students and then they would draw them and he included those colored plates in um, the book. It's primary sources from 18th century guild regulations. There are like letters between um, government officials about enforcing guild regulations in Puebla. Um, it's a really thorough history and material analysis of Talavera in Mexico. And I included the table of contents because you can just see like how much information he's bringing forward. And then he also includes, I just thought it was cool, the like identifying marks seen on Mexican ceramics. So those are at the top. The one on the left is um, Damian Hernandez's mark, and he was like one of the master potters in Puebla. Our ASM jar is actually unmarked, so we do not have an artist's signature for it. So all of the information I found about Atlee Barber had me thinking about the impact of his writings and the impact of Maolica of Mexico and kind of what he said about Talavera and how he talked about Talavera in the early 1900s. So he is undoubtedly extremely important with his work and research on Talavera and he brought a bunch of collections to the Philadelphia Art Museum. Um, something that I noticed though is that the way he talked about Mexico, Mexican Maolica and Mexican potters in his earlier writings, specifically to enamel pottery, they're not favorable. Um, it actually shows more of like, 
kind of a negative opinion of Mexican maiolica. He uses words like crude, poor, and coarse, and I'm going to go more into depth into those specific words. Um, maiolica, and then admittedly, maiolica of Mexico, he changes his language a little bit. He doesn't use as much of the language that he used to describe Talavera before, like in tin and nail pottery. Um, but there's still very much this idea that Mexican ceramics are a copy or an imitation of Spanish, Italian, Dutch objects, those like better European objects, and those Mexican potters were not highly regarded. And so kind of thinking about the language of Talavera in the early 1900s and how people were talking about it led me to Francis Tor. Um, so Francis Tor was an American anthropologist who lived in Mexico City for much of her life. She moved there in 1922. Um, and she was like a folk researcher. And she was also very closely involved with the artists and the intellectuals during the Mexican Revolution. Um, and for about 12 years, she published, she published this journal called uh, Mexican Folkways. She collaborated with Diego Rivera, a lot of big artists. And then in 1947, um, she came out with the book, A Treasury of Mexican Folkways, and there's a section in the book on Mexican ceramics and pottery. And I kind of noticed her language in the same way I was noticing at Lee Barber's, um, in that it was not entirely like positive or praising Talavera. It was mostly talking about it in comparison to other art forms, other European art forms that they regard as better. So she dedicates about five pages to Mexican pottery and it especially focuses on Puebla. <clears throat> and so looking at these two sources led me to create um, what I call the problematic language index. Um, <laughs> so I used Ali Barber's Tin and Animal Pottery as well as Francis Torres' A Treasury of Mexican Folkways and I put in the pages, so it's four pages for Barber and then five pages from Tor. And I basically picked out the words that I felt were not favorable when they were talking about Talavera. And these were like the six words that I felt, they were either used in significant instances when describing Mexican ceramics or the author just said this word a lot um, when talking about Mexican ceramics. So, um, I isolated each word and then I used the definition from Merriam-Webster Dictionary. I usually just took the first definition that came up, unless like for poor, I think it said like not rich, so that didn't apply. Um, so crude, for example, um, the definition marked by the primitive, gross, or elemental, or, uh, or elemental, or by uncultivated simplicity or vulgarity. So in Barber's four pages that he uses on Mexican Maiolica, he uses the word crude to describe it four times. Um, one quote is, decorative work is generally crude. Um, so I did this for each of these different words in the primitive. Um, that one is in there with Tor, much is done in the primitive way of low wages. And so she talked about like these Mexican potters and these Mexican processes like as if they were primitive, as if they were inferior. Um, there's one specific quote I'm going to read you from Adley Barber, which I thought was very interesting. He says, The maiolica, which is found in abundance in the vicinity of Puebla, seems to be of two distinct varieties, one of which, and evidently the earlier, more strongly resembles the old Spanish and Chinese products in forms and coloring, while the other, of coarser texture and glaze and inferior decoration, reveals a distinct native Mexican feeling in treatment, particularly in the crude and gaudy coloring. So that's a quote from Tin and Animal Pottery, um, where he uses, I think, like three of these words in just that one sentence. Um, so this is an incomplete language index. There could definitely be more sources added, more words added. Um, but I really just wanted to point out kind of the stereotyping of Mexico, especially in the early 1900s and how it's impacted how people look at and study Mexican ceramics. Um, there's, there's this idea of Mexico and Talavera prevailing that it's inferior, it's primitive, it's an imitation of the European, and it was being perpetuated by these American scholars who were coming to Mexico. Um, and so despite all of this, and despite like kind of the poor treatment of Talavera, it's still gained popularity, it's gained attention, um, people have been studying it more thoroughly, 
And so Talavera through the 20th century, um, in the era of post-Mexican revolution, the government was really pushing for tourism and a cultural exchange with the United States. Um, and this is really when like a ton of Talavera collections started coming to the United States. Um, so the Philadelphia Museum of Art, Mexican Ceramics Collection, their accession numbers are all from 1907, 1908. The Met has a big Mexican Mayolica collection given in 1911. Um, Iman Beck, the ASM jar came in 1961. Um, so there was just a big interest in Talavera increasing and it's starting and it was really making its way as a symbol of Mexican ceramics and a symbol of Mexican culture. And so on here I included um, kind of the like Viva Mexico tourism propaganda that they were coming out with. Um, that one's by Jorge Gonzalez Camarena. And then I also included an Edward Weston photograph of Talavera that we have at the Center for Creative Photography. Um, and then also like a curio shop from 1925 in Mexico City where they sold Talavera like it was nothing. So, Thinking about Talavera now and moving into Talavera now and how it has kind of had this like lasting power and impact, um, it continues to adapt and it continues to remain relevant and interesting. Um, my minor is art education, so this semester one of my classes I created an elementary school lesson plan for fourth or fifth graders using the ASM jar um, where I like, taught them about the jar um, and then they got to create their own blue and white Talavera jar and they got to like display it in the room and stuff, so that was really fun. And then La Cabana in Tucson, which is at Mercado San Agustin, they sell and collect antique Mexican Talavera. So I just took these screenshots from their Instagram. The one on the right is a 16th century Talavera jar that they have there. Um, and then I also wanted to include the Talavera exhibit at the Museo Franz Meyer in Mexico City. And if you notice up at the right, that's the jar. Um, and then I also included the Arizona State Museum Pottery Vault. So this is where the jar usually lives. Um, and I just, I feel like throughout this whole semester and throughout this whole project, I've really just been thinking about why it's so important to me and why this jar has stuck in my mind. And I think I'm still looking for the answer for that, but I want to continue to do more research with this jar and continue learning about Talavera and learning about why it's collectible now, why it went from crude to collectible. And I think I found out a lot this semester, but there's always more to learn. So, yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs>
I was just like, if he said any of this now, I feel like he would have been called out. But in 1907, you know, that was like how they described Mexico was crude, primitive, and stuff. So it's interesting. Yeah, Dr. Yeah, I connected to that. I was curious. I was um, I was so excited when you said that he had this information about the gills mm -hmm. that were producing the Talavera. And I was curious if there's any description of the artists who were in these guilds, and if you find if you found that there's any direct connection between the type of language that he's using and the kind of like ethnic or racial bias or anything. Like that. Yeah, so that's really interesting. So in the guilds, they were so what I read in the guild regulations, which actually like confused me slightly, was in the guild regulations it said only Spanish potters. So you were not allowed to be native Mexican and be a, like a master potter be in the guild. So it was only Spanish potters allowed in the guilds. Um, and I think as time progressed, they started to train native Mexican potters in um, the tin enameled process, but they really like did not like them very much. They really disregarded them, like saw them as like not very good imitators, not very good copiers. There's a there was a quote from Frances Tor where I think she says like they're not very good at copying. Mexican potters. Yeah. <laughs> I'm interested in the twins. And um, do you imagine that these were commissioned pieces and they were they were meant as to be displayed together? Oh, that's a great question. I actually haven't even thought about that because, yeah, this one is in such like a different state than the other one. Um, I would imagine. I feel like if I had to make an educated guess right now, I would say they were probably in the same church together. Like I could kind of imagine them being like little end pieces or something, but that's just like a complete guess. I think it would be really interesting to see them together. But also in the guilds and in the workshops, they were they were doing like patterns of similarities and all kinds. So, but yeah, I do think it's really interesting that there's there's like an exact copy. Of the dimensions are exact. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How did you find the twin? Was it known already? Like, did, did somebody say, oh, there's one down in Pueblo, or did you find it? Um, so Dr. Whitfield actually pointed it out to me. She, last fall, um, she sent us, like, a Franz Meyer web thing, um, and she was like, does this look familiar to you guys? And it was the jar, but it was Franz Meyer's version. And Franz Meyer does not have a completely like accessible website. Um, it's really hard to get into their collections database and like look at like the provenance of this object. Like I can't even find their collections database. I've tried a lot, but so that's why I was trying to get in contact with the Franz Meyer directly. Um, and I just haven't had success. Yet. So maybe you should go down there. And visit. Maybe you know I think I should. <laughs> Um, uh, a little while ago, we had a presentation, a Zoom presentation, by Marta Turok, who is a curator there, and she's specifically a curator of the Ruth Machuca collection, but she's got a very robust uh, presence on Facebook, and I think she'd be a really good contact to get in there. Um, I also remember when you were giving your talk, and we, I had uh, his, uh, Michael Brescia on our staff, uh, his wife is from, from Puebla, mm -hmm. and uh, I asked him, and plus he's, well, a bit of a historian to say the least, um, <clears throat> that um, how, how likely something like that would have had a, a context uh, for a church. And he said that he and his wife, and nobody he knows had ever seen this kind of a, of a uh, piece in a religious context. And so I'm wondering, in your research, did you find other uh, uh, corroboration of this idea that they might have had a, a church context? Yeah, in, um, so in Mayolica, Mexico, he talked about like the religious aspect of a lot of like the potters and how the guilds would be like commissioned by the church. Um, but I think it was in a research paper, like a thesis paper that I read over the summer where it talked about like the religious aspect of Talavera, um, especially because, yeah, the tiles were really big in the churches. When you think that maybe yeah. a baptistry or something? Yeah, or something, something like that. that. <clears throat> but then, you know, what would, you know, be an umbrella stand or something? Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just for fun, maybe. <laughs> yeah, any other questions? I do. Oh, it's Dr. Oh. <laughs> well, you didn't talk very much about the iconography. Does that suggest anything about the context? Well, I guess um, in my first iteration of the project, I focused a lot on the iconography. So I kind of wanted to try to like 
build off of that. Um, but I feel like the iconography is difficult to analyze because there are so many interpretations for it. And like I'm sure that the potter had a specific flower in mind that they were painting, but it's hard to discern that now. And there have been a lot of sources um, that are like comparing Chinese motifs from porcelain to Talavera motifs and how they kind of adapted those and then would kind of um, come up with like their own motifs to incorporate like Mexican culture into the painting. But yeah, that's I'll have to look into that more because it is difficult to find like about th this specific piece. And um, I remember last fall we had a lot of discussion about the structure in the middle um, and the decoration. Is it a mosque? Is it a church? And um, we kind of concluded that it was not a mosque because it's uh, 18th century Mexico, so they were pretty Catholic back then. Um, but there was a lot of Islamic art influence on Talavera, like the Arab forms and um, I think it's called Mukanas, that kind of do, yeah, that do um, that kind of line structure. So I feel like this jar has a lot of mysteries in terms of its like motifs and decoration. Um, I just didn't get to it. <laughs> Uh, at first, I did congratulate you on your fantastic presentation. I was too excited for my question, but <laughs> congratulations. And, and second, I was curious, um, I love how you were kind of, it was like a critique of the historiography itself, and I was curious if in this this project you looked into the contemporary scholarship on Talavera for one, because I think there was a, a volume published by the Denver Art Museum mm -hmm. on the Trans-Pacific Exchange. So I was just curious like what how the scholarship has changed if you look at what kinds of questions scholars are asking about this material now. Yeah, so I have definitely looked into um, kind of some of the contemporary scholarship. There's like James Olis wrote like a whole book and I have a couple of the Denver Art Museum books. Um, and I would say now the scholarship on Talavera is more interested in like how the cross-cultural influences combined to make it Mexican now. Because when you look at this, you say that's Mexican. You don't say like, oh, that's Spanish, Islamic, um, Asian, like it's it's Mexican. And so I feel like now the scholarship is really trying to define what does some like what does it mean when something is Mexican, when something represents Mexico? Um, kind of the idea of like cultural hybridity, um, mestizaje with that like cultural blending and stuff. So I feel like that's really what the scholarship is looking at now. And I think it's trying to give more credit to Talavera and to Mexican potters because, I mean, they adapted this um, tin enamel pottery technique from Spain and kind of just made it something that's completely Mexican, so. Yay, um, my boyfriend brought some palm dulces that are on the table outside. <laughs> um, so, yeah, and then if you want to come look at the jar up close, feel free. Before the pendulces. Yeah, before the pendulces, don't bring them in.